Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Marion Nessel, who is the Paulette Goddard Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at New York University. She chaired that department from 1988 to 2003. She is also Professor of Sociology at NYU and Visiting Professor of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell. At Berkeley in 2017, she is the Barbara Weinstock Lecturer on the Morals of Trade. Her many publications include Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influenced Nutrition and Health, Safe Food, the Politics of Food Safety, What to Eat, Why Calories Count from Science to Politics, Eat, Drink, Vote, an Illustrated Guide to Food Politics, and most recently, Soda Politics, Taking on Big Soda and Winning. Professor Nestle, welcome <laughs> to Berkeley. Glad to be back. Uh, where were you born and raised? In New York City. And uh, looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, um, my father was a bit of an anarchist and um, was very interested in social justice, so I grew up in one of those families where those were big issues. And, and was there a lot of reading in the household? There was quite a lot of reading. Um, yeah, we read. We read newspapers. That's a habit. I, it's a lifetime habit. And keeping up with political events and world events. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you first get the food nutrition bug, if I can use that expression? When, when, what, what first piqued your interest in, in not just eating food, but studying it? Well, actually, the eating food was a really profound experience because I went to a summer camp in Vermont. And if you, the people who ran the camp were fabulous cooks. And they had a very large vegetable garden that supplied the food for the camp. It was a small camp. And if you were good, you got to go pick the vegetables mm -hmm. for dinner. And I remember I was about eight or nine years old and was sent out in midsummer to pick string beans. And, you know, I started picking them and then I bit into one and I couldn't believe it. It was warm from the sun, it was sweet, it was crisp, it was absolutely delicious. I never tasted a bean like that before. That got me interested in food. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what about politics? Uh, were you growing up in New York City and was there a, 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 a real sense of political developments? Well, actually, I grew up in Los Angeles because my family oh. moved to Los Angeles when I was 12. But I was given a nutrition course to teach on my first teaching job. And it was obvious right from the beginning mm -hmm. that you couldn't really understand why people ate the way they did unless you understood the politics of it. And I remember giving students in that class a series of articles in the New York Review of books on sugar politics uh, right from the beginning. Mm. So it was always there. And, and where were you educated? Berkeley. Berkeley. And you got your BA here? And I have four degrees from mm -hmm. Berkeley, an Associate of Arts, a Bachelor of Arts, a Doctorate, and a Master's in Public Health. And, and, but you also uh, studied uh, microbiology here, or is that? Yes, I was an undergraduate bacteriology major. I did my doctorate in molecular biology, and then I did a master's in public health nutrition quite a bit later. And at, at Berkeley, did you have any mentors who, who especially influenced you? Well, in, when I was in graduate school, certainly. A, as an undergraduate, I was just trying to figure it all out. And were you here during uh, the, the political turmoil of, of the 60s? Oh, I was here during the political turmoil of the 50s and the 60s. Um, you know, when I was an undergraduate, it was when the civil rights movement was starting and the women's movement was starting. And in, when I was a graduate student, it was the free speech movement. And were you drawn into those uh, uh, Happenings? Very much drawn into it, but I had two small children, and there was no way that I could put myself in a position where I could be arrested because I wouldn't have anyone to take care of my children. So I understood why it was so difficult for women to be revolutionaries. 
And uh, of course, the, the revolution—the revolution was creating a revolution in in women's uh, consciousness at yes. the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to ask uh, my guests what skills they think students sh should acquire if, for example, they want to go into nutrition studies. Well, how would you uh, advise them? Is there uh, doing nutrition research? What does it take to do that well? Well, I think you know, need to know how to do research in general, and that means an undergraduate program that teaches you how to use a library, how to search for information, how to check whether information is accurate or not, how to think critically about the information that you are looking for. Um, I happen to do graduate work in molecular biology, and what I think I got out of that was always trying to think about what alternative explanation there could be for the result that you thought you were getting. Critical thinking in biology, the game when I was a graduate student was to try to think of something that could have accounted for the results that hadn't been controlled for in the experiments. That's proved very useful in thinking about nutrition research. And, and also there's, a, there's an emphasis on a, a, a problem that has been defined by the field. Uh, the reason I ask that is the political aspect of your work is very different. Uh, so I'm, where I'm, I'm going here is to compare your scientific studies with uh, your, your sense of politics. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what happened with nutrition science was a huge change in the nutrition problems in the world. Nutrition science started out looking at what nutrients were required by the human body and in what amounts. And that research was straightforward, um, not politically fraught in any way whatsoever. Uh, the results were clear and understandable. The, where the complications came in were trying to see how experimental results applied to populations. But there wasn't anything controversial about it. When nutrition got controversial was when chronic diseases became the leading causes of death and disability in the United States and in developed countries. And then nutritionists needed to look at dietary patterns and instead of producing dietary advice that encouraged people to eat more of things that were required in the diet, they were talking about eating less, eating less saturated fat, eating less salt, eating less sugar. And all of a sudden it got very, very political because that stepped on the toes of the companies that were making those products. And, and when did this change in thinking occur? Well, I think it started in the 1950s. I mean, there are uh, books in the 1950s that have uh, Ansel Keys, for example, who's a cardiologist in Minnesota, uh, did a cookbook with his wife in the late 1950s with dietary recommendations in it that look like today's dietary guidelines. I mean, they've never changed. Eat less sugar, eat less saturated fat, eat less salt eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, don't gain, don't gain too much weight. I mean, really basic dietary advice. So that was already known in the 1950s. It just took a long time to come into public consciousness, particularly because the food industry fought it so hard. And, and when, how does this uh, change you're talking about relate to the industrialization of agriculture? Uh, and, and especially after World War II. In other words, is there an interface there? Oh, absolutely. What happened with agriculture was that uh, there was a, the, the policies used to be, we'll pay farmers not to grow very much food in order to keep the price of the foods high enough to support the farmers. That changed in the 1970s. You know, the famous Earl Butts, who was Secretary of Agriculture, um, said this, these policies are wrong. We should be encouraging farmers to grow as much food as they possibly can, and they did. And what happened then was that there was an enormous surplus of food. Farmers were very good at growing more when they were rewarded for growing more. And the price of food, of basic food commodities dropped because 
there was so much of it. And then food company, the number of calories in the food supply increased. And food companies had to figure out how to sell their food products in an environment in which there was way too much food, far more than the population needed. And that's been the problem ever since. Uh, and uh, now in your awakening in terms of the politics of this, was that gradual over time? You mentioned your, your first teaching assignment, uh, you also were in the government for a while, but uh, was what you were seeing with regard to uh, the problems of food production, uh, how did that come about over time? Uh, oh no, I had an epiphany. <laughs> I see. And, and, <laughs> and that epiphany occurred at a meeting of the National Cancer Institute in the early 1990s. Uh, the people who were at that, this was a, a meeting on behavioral causes of cancer, and they had a couple of people talking about diet, and a lot of physicians who were anti-smoking advocates talking about cigarette smoking. And I had never, I mean, I knew that cigarettes were bad for you and I knew they caused cancer, uh, but I had never seen presentations of cigarette marketing before. And the people who spoke at this conference showed slide after slide after slide of cigarette marketing all over the world in the remote Himalayas, in the jungles of Africa. And then uh, someone got up and did a presentation on cigarette marketing to children. And this was the, the days, these were the days of Joe Camel. And I knew about Joe Camel. I had seen Joe Camel ads, but I had never paid any attention to them before. They were so much a part of the landscape that they were easy to ignore. You just paid no attention to it. And yet this presentation made it clear that the cigarette industry was deliberately targeting children in just in hundreds and hundreds of different ways. And I walked out of that presentation thinking, we should be doing this for Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. we nutritionists. And I started paying attention. And, and then after you had your degrees, you actually went and worked for the, the government and was an advisor uh, or rather uh, a programmer for the writing of the, the guidelines? No, I was a, I worked for the um, Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in Health and Human Services as what was called a Senior Nutrition Policy Advisor, a very fancy title. What I was actually doing was editing a book called the Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition mm. and Health that came out in 1988. And that's when you got a shock, which was you were told there were certain things you couldn't write? Oh, on my first day on the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was told the Surgeon General's report, no matter what the research said, would never say eat less meat. It would find some other kind of euphemism for it, but it would never say eat less meat because if it did, the Department of Agriculture, which represented the meat industry, would get very upset. They would go to Congress and the report would never come out. So it used euphemisms. So, so you're, this is a step-by-step -step process in a way. And it, first you're learning about advertising and being shocked by that. Well, actually, that, that came later. That came <laughs> later. Well, it doesn't later. matter. The sequence uh -huh. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But it's really, but hey, the government, which is supposed to helping in this process of informing people about food, uh, is shackled. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I had a, that, those two years in Washington were revelatory. I mean, I learned things I didn't even know I didn't know. Uh, on that job. I mean, I had no idea how politicized these things were and how you had to, I mean, this was, after all, during the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. um, and I was dealing with people in the Department of Agriculture who were very eager to protect the um, meat industry, the dairy industry, the food processing industry, all of the major food industries uh, were under the protection of the Department of Agriculture. Um, because the people who worked there were very much in favor of corporate agriculture and corporate food production and found these health issues to be, uh, you know, recommending people eat less of these things. That was un-American. Uh, I'm curious how your 
work as a nutritionist interfaces with your activism as somebody who's concerned uh, uh, about uh, the politics of this. Do, do, do the two backgrounds challenge you or do the perspectives inform each other? Oh, I can't separate them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, when, when I think about these problems, I think about them from the science all the way to the advocacy and everything in between. Um, I don't think it's possible to talk about dietary recommendations or what people should be eating without understanding how the food system works, um, how the agriculture system works, where the pressures are, who the stakeholders are. All of those things are all part of it. But, but you were also a, a front runner, a leader in identifying this connection. Well, ap apparently, uh, uh, I thought I was just stating the obvious, mm -hmm. that I was, um, my book, Food Politics, which came out in 2002, um, was really the first to talk about these kinds of issues, but I thought I was just describing what was obvious to anybody who looked. Uh, but it wasn't. Apparently uh, not. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't obvious to the general public. Apparently not. Yeah. And, and uh, as you talk about nutrition and the change of thinking in nutrition, one gets a sense because it's food and we all eat, it, it interfaces with developments in the world, namely you know, changes in what people are eating because of the politics of the production system. Well, and also we have a globalized food system in which companies sell foods all over the world. and. You can go to a supermarket in the dead of winter in Manhattan and buy blueberries from Chile or Argentina. I mean, that's a globalized food system. And, and so then what are the challenges of, it, of the interface between these two? Is it, does, do you have to think twice about the conclusion you're reaching uh, uh, because of the interface with politics? or not? Well, I can't separate the politics okay. from okay. either the science or the production or the public health aspects. I mean, the politics are always part of it because if you are advising the public to eat more of one thing and less of another, you're stepping on somebody's toes big time, mm -hmm. especially if people listen. Yeah, the reason I'm pushing you on this is that, that, that your perspective is unique in other areas because part of the American political culture is not seeing the politics in issues like health care and so on. Well, I would hope that people would see the politics no, in health care today. I, 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 <laughs> right. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not being critical here. Mm. I'm just sort of, mm. sort of saying the, the extent to which, oh, that's politics. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know how mm -hmm. that affects. So it's a, what I'm trying to say well, is I a, hear that from students. Yeah, yeah. You know, I teach courses in food politics and food policy, and the students are extraordinarily uncomfortable um, thinking about the politics. It's not something that they're comfortable with. They don't feel like they want to participate in it. It feels kind of dirty um, they, and remote. And part of what I try to do is to show that every single food choice they make is a political choice. And is this because we're, we and the students are passive and, and they don't, uh, the, the de de default position is not to take an active role and that's what is required? Well, I think that you know the students that I talk to tell me that they just don't feel like they have any power to take mm. an active role. They don't feel empowered. They don't feel like their individual actions will have any effect. The problems of society seem so enormous and so immutable that they don't feel like they can do anything to affect change, especially now. Um, so the part of what I try to do is to demonstrate that the food system has changed so much and in so many ways for the better that you can use food in a way that will make very positive changes in people's lives and you really can have an effect uh, in a time period that you can actually notice. Uh, another uh, uh, aspect of your work and of your books is how clearly written they are. 
and uh, uh, they're written for a broad public so that people can understand things. But, but language is a tool in this struggle. And uh, one gets the sense, quite obviously, that language is a tool used by the food industry to obscure the mm -hmm. discoveries that are made. Mm -hmm. Talk a little about that, because it's very important. In other words, we're always being confronted in advertising which, with a simple way of saying something that actually obscures uh, the, the, the truths that nutrition science has revealed. Well, advertising is designed to appeal to emotion. It's not designed to appeal to cognitive structures, mm -hmm. and academics are trying to appeal to people's higher order thinking. Mm -hmm. I try to write clearly about nutrition because I think so much of what we know about nutrition is obfuscated by advertising, by the enormous interest of the food industry in selling food products beyond anything else. I mean, for example, the, I mean, I've just written a book called Soda Politics, and so I use so the soda industry as an example because it's a really easy one. And I just saw some, a student, just a former student, just sent me a photograph of an advertisement on the New York subway um, where Coca-Cola is advertising physical activity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're active, you'll be healthy. Um, and then here's Coca-Cola at the bottom of it. So you can drink it with the implication being that as long as you're walking up the stairs in the subway, you can drink as much Coca-Cola as you like. Mm -hmm. and, and also the use of words like moderation and balance. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, there's a real uh, war here uh, be between the people who want to change what we eat and the people who are producing what we already eat. And think that what we're eating is just fine. Sure, so everything in moderation. Um, you can use that in two completely different ways. I use it all the time mm -hmm. because I happen to, I love to eat and I don't have any food restrictions and yes, I eat junk food and yes, I eat ice cream and yes, I eat all kinds of things that horrify people. Um, but uh, that's where I would say everything in moderation, it's fine. I mean, mostly I eat a pretty healthy diet. The food industry uses it in mm -hmm. another sense, which is you can eat our products. And their idea of moderation and mine might be quite different. Mm -hmm. and, and journalism plays a role in this. Uh, I emphasize the clarity of your writings because journalism is an entry point for keeping things the way they are or changing them. Mm. Yes, I wrote a column for the San Francisco Chronicle for about five years, so I've had a little journalistic mm. experience. And that was an interesting experience. I was writing on deadline, uh, which I didn't like very much, mm -hmm. and, and trying to communicate often very complicated ideas in a way that people could grasp without going through all the nuances which if you're a scientist, you have to have in there. It's not easy to write about nutrition in a simplistic way. And when I see journalists writing about nutrition as everything you know about nutrition was wrong, um, discount that one. Or it's really, you know, sugar is the only problem with the diet, fat is the only problem with the diet. All of those kinds of things are journalistic approaches uh, that I think oversimplify and are not helpful in the long run, but they make people buy books. And, and, and simplicity to work has to reveal the complexity, either of the research <laughs> yeah. or of the politics. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the I, quote, I love to quote Michael Pollan's comment on what people should eat. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. I mean, that is an absolutely brilliant simple way of um, expressing com uh, concepts that are really quite complicated. I thought he did a great job of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the striking things when one reads your work the, and, and uh, when you explore the arsenal of the food industry 
is that they use terminology that it, across sectors is embedded in the political culture. What I have in mind is freedom of choice. Ah, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. we we don't want a police state mm -hmm. uh, or a nanny new, state, a nanny state mm -hmm. or a nutritionist from Berkeley mm -hmm. uh, telling us what to eat mm -hmm. because we as American pride ourselves mm -hmm. on freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. We're hearing that in the, in the medical mm -hmm. uh, reform efforts now uh, as the opposition tries to stop things like Obamacare. Talk a little about that because it's a real challenge. It's, yeah, it's very, very difficult to deal with, but you, know, you don't really have a choice. You only have a choice of what's there. Mm -hmm. And of course, they never talk about the billions and billions and billions of dollars that go into marketing the most profitable products that are usually, unfortunately, the most profitable products are the ones that are least healthful. Um, so the budget for um, just classic Coca-Cola is $250 million a year just in the United States. To advertise. Just the, for advertising that goes through advertising agencies just in the United States, just for that one product. And when you're seeing, when you're bombarded with messages over and over and over again, you don't even notice them. They're just so embedded in your consciousness that you just sort of automatically reach for it. Um, so the choice is being influenced. The choice is influenced by the way grocery stores position their products, um, and that's paid for. That's not random. It's totally paid for. It's influenced by the marketing and the way that the restaurants operate and the way that grocery stores operate. Um, all of this is planned. And so your choice is a choice that has to be made in the context of a lot of economic decisions that these companies have made, but of course you don't see those. And, and, and uh, the political perspective empowers you to see uh, a, a larger structure, which you have to see to get over the hurdle of changing people's attitudes toward food. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. One of the reasons why the Berkeley soda tax succeeded was because there was on the ground one-on-one -on -one conversations with people trying to explain to them that the, here was a corporation selling something that was really bad for people if consumed. I mean, here's where moderation comes mm -hmm. in, if consumed in large amounts. Um, and that if you want to protect yourself against some of the conditions that are associated with drinking a lot of sugary beverages, you need to look at what the corporations are doing as well as what you like or what's been advertised. And particularly when that advertisement has been directed particularly at you. Mm -hmm. And, and so, in the, say, in the case of the Berkeley uh, tax, it's really important to say, hey, this really has health implications. I mean, it, it's affecting your body in mm -hmm. a way that you right. may or may not understand. But it, but it was also Berkeley against big soda, mm -hmm. which made it clear that here was this big, cor the big corporations, the American Beverage Association, um, you know, funded by Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, mainly, um, was coming in and fighting a public health measure. That's what they were doing, and that was made very visible in Berkeley, and I think that was part of the reason so, for the success. So, so to bring out the, 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 the structure. Politics. Yeah, the politics. Right, yeah, the politics, the mm. politics. Yeah, that this doesn't occur in a political vacuum. Yeah. Now, now, going back to what you were saying about nutrition, it's interesting because what, what you were saying is that in a way, nutrition changed because of what doctors were seeing you know, in terms of chronic illness. Mm. So the environment in many ways impinges on the thinking uh, and, and other sectors are, are helping inform us. Mm. So you are a person who, as a nutritionist, clarifies it and, and gives us these works mm. on issues, but, but you're also getting help from doctors who are 
uh, in a way, seeing the effect of the bad food. Well, I would say it's, you know, uh, these are public health implications, yeah. and there was a big shift after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. From Remember, the, in, d before the Second World War, one of the really difficult problems that they had in inducting people into the army was that people suffered from nutritional deficiencies. Um, especially if they came from poor areas. Mm -hmm. And after the war, the food supply improved enormously because we had figured out how to get food across the country. You know, the transportation system improved enormously. And all of a sudden, much more food was available. People were eating more. And people started getting heart disease. People started developing obesity. They started getting type 2 diabetes. These were diseases that had been quite rare mm -hmm. before. And now, all of a sudden, they were common and everybody was seeing them. And it took a while for researchers to try to figure out what diet had to do with that. Um, I think people were just eating more, and that was the bigger problem. But Let's talk a little about the food industries. You touched on some of this before, but Let's clarify it for our audience. The, the dilemma of the food industry is they're producing too much food and they have to sell it in a competitive environment. Well, that's the overall yeah. dilemma. The, the dilemma for an individual company is how do I sell my product? Well, let's just start with calories. So the American food supply has an average of 4,000 calories available per capita. Per capita means little tiny babies, um, sedentary elderly people. It means everybody. It's roughly twice what the population needs. So if you're a food company in that situation, you have, and you're trying to sell your product, and you have to remember, if you're a publicly traded company, you must report growth to Wall Street every 90 days. It's not enough to make a profit. You have to grow your profits. The single biggest driver of obesity, in my opinion, is what Wall Street does to companies. So companies have to sell. And they don't care what the public health implications are of what they're selling. They care a lot about the economic implications because their shareholders want to get some dividends out of that. So they find new ways to sell food products. They make bigger portions because the cost of food is very cheap, the cost of labor is high, you can make a big portion, it doesn't cost you much, and you can make a huge profit on it. They put food everywhere, absolutely everywhere, so that if you go to a department store, there are gonna be candy bars at the, check, at the checkout counter. Um, drug stores now look like food stores mm -hmm. because there's so much profit in selling a lot of these kinds of things. Everybody eats, everybody's going to be buying food. And they advertise and market. They market to kids, they market to minorities. And, and in this warfare between the people who want us to eat well and the companies that want to sell even the worst food, they, 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 they are, the, the, the food companies are a moving target because whenever something new comes up, there's a new revelation, then they want to package their product to make it seem that they are responsible. Oh, yeah, they're really so, good at that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. so, so basically, if uh, someone identifies a nutrient that's important, then that's plastered all over the, mm -hmm. it's, it may be added, but then it's plastered all mm -hmm. over the, uh, uh, the box of cereal, mm -hmm. say. But, but the issue is, Eating well involves your total diet, not mm -hmm. that you're eating a particular nutrient. Mm -hmm. Nutrient. Yeah, and I never talk about nutrients at all anymore. Yeah. I mean, just not at all. Um, I think they're for Americans who have plenty to eat and get enough calories and eat a reasonable variety of food. Nutrients are irrelevant. Um, there's very, very little evidence for nutrient deficiencies in people in the United States. I mean, it's practically non-existent. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. I know there are people who disagree with that, but there's very, very little evidence for frank nutrition, nutrient deficiencies. The big problems are that people are eating too much. And that's a more difficult problem to deal with because there are cultural factors and societal factors that encourage people to eat more than they need. Restaurants serve big portions because people love them. 
and people are unaware of the number of calories that they're taking in. I mean, I'm, I'm always you know, saying that if I had one thing that I could teach people, it was, it's that larger portions have more calories. I can't even say it with a straight face mm -hmm. because it seems so ridiculous. But there's plenty of evidence that that's not intuitively obvious. It's interesting. Uh, I interviewed once a vice president of, of Coke and the extent to which they, they find substitutes or alternatives mm -hmm. for the issue. So mm -hmm. uh, at that point, uh, uh, Coke was emphasizing to be active, mm -hmm. on the other hand. Oh, yeah, Another they still thing, are. Yeah, <laughs> and they, mm -hmm. they, they, they basically, there was an argument about water. They had gotten into water purification mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and doing, doing, doing good in the third world by purifying water. Mm -hmm. So there's a, th this, this arsenal is very subtle and it interfaces uh, in a really insidious way with what might be the best in information. We should be active, but they seem to be saying, oh, be active, but also drink Coke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, they're just trying to sell products, mm -hmm. that's all. Um, you know, if they're a publicly traded company, they have to grow their profits. That means selling more and more and more and more. Um, and that's what they're about. Mm -hmm. Th that's their job. Public health is a big pain for them. I mean, Coca-Cola started listing obesity as the number one threat to its profits as early as 2003. Um, where in, it, when it, in its filings to the Securities and Exchange Commission, where it has to list all the things that are hazards to its profits, obesity has been number one mm. because of public health people who are saying that sugary beverages have something to do with obesity. It's a big problem for them. So this puts them, it pits them against public health. And whereas they would love to make as much money off of bottled water or diet drinks as they make off of classic Coca-Cola, they can't. It's more profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the role of government enters into this. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we've talked already about uh, uh, advisories of uh, our government about what to eat and how they're constrained. But, but a bigger issue is something like the agricultural bill, which essentially puts in place a structure of government financing which benefits those production processes that are creating too much food. Exactly, and also benefits the ingredients of processed foods um, so that the main agricultural subsidies or protections or insurance payments go to the producers of corn, soybeans, um, cotton seed, and so forth and so on. Very little of it goes to fruits and vegetables. So you have this curious contradiction where one office of the Department of Agriculture tells everybody to make half their plate fruits and vegetables, and yet there's very, very little public farm bill money going into supporting fruits and vegetables. The last farm bill had a few hundred million dollars, but that's a rounding error mm -hmm. in the billions and billions that go into the farm bill. It's very, very small, and it's likely to be cut. Yesterday in your lecture, you pointed out that food, uh, vegetables and fruits gets 0.45% mm -hmm. of that budget, whereas tobacco got 2%. 2%. Yeah, this was 2008 to 2012. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and so what, how can we change the government? Look, we've just had a, <laughs> a foodie first lady, mm -hmm. basically, but one gets the sense that uh, in, in addition to promoting being active and growing your own vegetable garden, that the, 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 there was a lot that the Obamas could not do. Well, that certainly um, is one argument about that. I, it was very complicated. I mean, Mrs. Obama took a leadership role in food that was extraordinarily important. And the White House garden gave lots of people to grow garden, gave permission for lots of people to grow gardens. It promoted organic gardening. It 
I, I mean, it just had an enormous effect. Very difficult to measure, but I believe it had an enormous effect on the food movement. Tell, I mean, I was thrilled. Imagine having a first lady interested in the same issues I was interested mm -hmm. in. That was kind of fabulous. Uh, but when she uh, g came up against the line in the sand, and I believe that marketing to children is the food industry's line in the sand, and it's one that they will not cross, they will not allow anyone to cross, uh, she tried very hard to get them to back off on marketing to children um, and made at least two extraordinary, eloquent, beautifully, beautifully constructed speeches about that to the food industry, but she had no elected power to do anything. Mm -hmm. She had no elected responsibility. She didn't hold a federal office. All she had was leadership, and they could pay no... Moral leadership. Moral leadership. leadership. This was moral, moral leadership, um, which I think had an enormous effect in ways that are not easy to measure. Um, but which didn't change the food system in any measurable way because she couldn't do I mean, she was opposed at every single thing she was trying to do by the food industry. If they didn't like what was happening, they went right to Congress and got an appropriations bill to put something in that stopped it. And I can think of at least four examples of that. Four examples mm -hmm. where the food industry went to Congress and got some um, something in an appropriations bill to make ketchup a vegetable, to uh, allow potatoes to be served in school meals every single day, no restrictions, to stop a interagency effort to try to set nutrition standards for marketing to children. That was stopped cold. Mm -hmm. And then the business about the dietary guidelines not saying anything about sustainability. I mean, these kinds of things. These are fighting public health measures using the political system in a way that most food advocates don't have access to because they don't have that kind of money. It's interesting because what, what seems to be emerging is a picture of a strategy that, uh, in, on the one hand, the, the power of the few food industry is so systemic that the, the right strategy is to chip away at one particular sector uh, oh, and yeah, hope that's, so is that, is that yeah, a I'm not, I'm, I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah. I mean, there's been an enormous change in the food system. When you go to a supermarket today, the food in the supermarkets today is so much better than it was 30 years ago. Just that young people don't remember because they weren't here 30 <laughs> years ago. Uh, it's really much, much better. And many um, food companies, many restaurants are serving food that is cleaner. It's better prepared. It's organic. It's um, not made with artificial colors and flavors. I mean, there have been enormous changes in the food industry that come from people voting with their fork for the kind of food that they want. And I don't think you can underestimate the role of individual food choice in that. Every time you make a decision about what you're going to be eating, you're voting with your fork for the kind of food system that you want. You want to, you buy your food at farmers markets, you're supporting far, small farmers. You're not supporting big agriculture. And the food industry is quite aware of that. And there have been many articles now talking about how the food industry has to respond to this enormous consumer demand for better, healthier food, food that's better for people in the environment. So I think the food movement is actually does have some power. It just doesn't have power in Washington. Mm -hmm. I wish it did. And, and so what you're describing is a change of consciousness broader than we may mm -hmm. realize, but on the other hand, that, that the, the, uh, the movement uh, could, should embrace the notion of choice. In other words, let's take choice mm -hmm. away from <laughs> the food industry mm -hmm. and put it in the hands of the people who want better food and want to be healthier. Yeah, I think that's happening. I mean, I, I see that happening. Um, you know, and to move from that, 
to political power in Washington means taking all of the thousands of organizations that are working on food issues of one kind or another and unifying them in some way so that they have some lobbying power and can control votes. But that means people have to get out and vote. Mm -hmm. uh, it means people have to run for office. It means people have to engage in the ugly, messy, money-controlled political system, which a lot of people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a movement also implicit in what's going on to, to making a difference at the local level? Because if you're mm -hmm. buying food from local markets, from local farmers, uh, and, and going to, to uh, uh, organic markets, uh, you're making choice, and, and so it, it's, it's an entree point into changing the system before Washington mm -hmm. changes itself, mm -hmm. and it may be more realistic. Yeah, I think it's far more realistic, and I tell students who are interested in making changes in the food system to do it locally. Look in your community and see what the needs are and work in the community. Go to your local schools. What kind of food are the kids eating in, that sc in those schools? Good, bad, and different. Can you make it better? Um, there's lots that can be done on the local level, and if enough is done on the local level, then Washington has to listen. And, and uh, what, obviously we, we're entering into a period of dark ages mm. in Washington. Mm. What should we be watching for uh, in the food area as something that the government may try to, to turn back a lot of the advances that have been made? Well, the big one is SNAP, the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food stamps is what it used to be called. That's the big one because it is 80% of the money that comes into the Department of Agriculture's Farm Bill appropriations. The, f the actual support for agriculture is only 20%. So it's this enormous um, $80 billion a year program that Congress is just dying to cut. And, and what to explain what this program does? It's food stamps. It's it, food? Provi it provides um, electronic benefits for people to go into grocery stores and buy food. Right. And, and so the change might be in what you can use that money to buy? No, the change will be to cut the amount of money, money. which is already quite minimal considering that there are 45 million people who have these benefits. Um, and for them, that's the last of the safety net in the United States for, for, for poor people. Um, the president's budget that came out quite recently has the most just cuts of these tiny little mm -hmm. programs that help poor people and help people with various kinds of things. And so they're cutting all of these, the argument being we don't want taxpayers who aren't interested in these things to be paying for these things. So that's the same argument is we don't want taxpayers to have to support schools if they don't have children mm -hmm. in schools. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's not the way societies should work. Right, and, and is, will there be resistance to these cuts from the food industry of all people? I mean, in other words, do they well, there, might, there actually might be yeah. because retail stores uh, get the most profits from the food stamp program. That's where people buy them. Mm -hmm. So retail stores, most of the money in food stamps is spent at retail stores. The retail stores don't want to lose that. So they might, but it's hard to know. Soda politics has been a place where there have been some successes. Mm. What, what has been the key to what makes it work? Because that's going to tell us about the political organizing that we need to do to, to change the food system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I subtitled Soda Politics, Taking on Big Soda and in parenthesis and winning um, because sales of sodas are down so far. They peaked in about 1999 and have been declining ever since. And this year for the first time, sales of bottled water exceeded sales of sugary beverages. We still have a long way to go, but they're way down. Now, the soda industry believes that public health advocacy is responsible for that, and I hope they're right. 
um, I'm going to assume that they're right. That means that public health advocates have done a terrific job of explaining to people that sugary beverages are not good for their health, that they predispose to diabetes, that they predispose to a whole lot of other conditions, and that people would be much healthier drinking less soda. And certainly there's loads of anecdotal evidence. Um, all I did was stop drinking sugary beverages and my, the weight just fell off. I mean, I've heard that so many times, I can't even count it. Um, so I think that message got out. And then advocates also uh, work to get sugary drinks out of schools, out of workplaces, got government agencies to say this is going to be a soda-free zone, hospitals to get rid of their vending machines. Uh, I mean, these efforts at the local level have added up, and it's become, in some social circles, no longer socially acceptable to drink Coke or Pepsi. If you were advising students to prepare for a future in which they were making choices uh, that affected what we eat uh, and they wanted to change the food industry, how, how should they prepare for that future in their own lives besides invoking choice on their own part? What, what else should they be studying to prepare for a future career in that work? Well, I want to turn students into food advocates. I want them out um, working with people to try to improve diets and make diets healthier for people on the planet. And there are loads and loads and loads of ways to do that because there are so many organizations that are working on these issues that you can pick the particular tiny piece that you want to work on, improving school food, and improving the environmental impact of you know, whatever the food system is doing, whatever it is, you can find an organization that's working on it. Join organizations, volunteer. And, and this really is an issue about inequality. Absolutely. Because we wealthy people know a lot of the stuff we're mm -hmm. talking about, but mm -hmm. the poor are mm -hmm more often the objects of the advertising. Absolutely. And, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a social it's absolutely a social justice issue. And you can work on social justice issues using food as an entry point in a way that you cannot do with any other political issue, in my view. Because everybody eats. So everybody can relate to it. Um, it's not hard to explain to people why the food system for them is the way that it is and what they can do to make changes in it. And lots of people are interested in listening. It's an exciting time. One of the things that emerges from your work and, and your presentations, you're, you remain an optimist. Absolutely, because I can see the changes. And, and is that what fuels your optimism? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I work with students. <laughs> How could you not be optimistic if you work with students? I mean, they're optimistic. They're so interested, they're so excited about what the future holds for them and so eager to make positive change. How could you not be? I mean, I get my inspiration from them. Um, and, you know, I try to support them in any way I can. Yes, go out and do it. No, don't be discouraged. Look at the changes that have taken place. Look at how much better supermarket food is. Look at the number of farmers markets. Look at how, at the sales of organics, to pick just one example. Um, and then my own personal example is look at what's happened with food education in universities. Mm -hmm. My department at NYU started a program in food studies in 1996, 21 years ago. We were it. There was one other program at Boston University in gastronomy, but we were the only sort of, that was in the School of Continuing Education. We were the only academically involved program. We started out with undergraduate masters and doctoral programs. Everybody thought we were crazy. Who would want to study about food? Who would want to do that? How are you going to get students? They couldn't believe it. The New York Times wrote about our program the week after it was approved by New York State. We had people in our office that afternoon holding the clipping and saying, I've waited all my life for this program. Mm. 
and we've never looked back. Now every university has some kind of food program going on. There are mm -hmm. five in New York City that I know of. Um, there are thousands and thousands of young people who are interested in food issue in a way that combines politics, sociology, science, whatever it is they're interested in. Um, they can use food. Everybody's figured out that you can use food to teach anything. One, one final question, uh, requiring a brief answer. Uh, what lesson do you think one can learn from your career? From mine? Yeah. Yeah, do what you like and it'll be really be fun. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> I want to thank you, uh, Professor Nestle, for being uh, with us today and coming back to Berkeley, your alma mater. My pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.